Thank you very much, David. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, my talk is going to echo some of the things that we've heard over the last uh, couple of inspirational, inspirational days. The power of new technology, the potential of big data, asking what does it all mean. But I'm going to talk about those questions in relation to cancer. So everybody in this room will have been touched by cancer, a relative, a friend. One in three of us will develop cancer. Every year, 13 million new diagnoses of cancer occur worldwide. And cancer has no respect for age or gender, for nationality or ethnicity, for wealth or for class. Cancer is indiscriminate and it is universal. And the reason that every single one of us has the potential to develop cancer is because cancer occurs when a group of our own cells goes rogue and starts to try and take over. So our cells are constantly turning over. A cell will die and it will have to be replaced, and it's replaced by a process known as cell division. Effectively, one cell just divides into two cells. And that process is very, very tightly controlled, so cells grow in a controlled fashion. So... What happens with, um, in the normal situation is one cell will divide into another cell, and that's very, very well controlled. But in cancer, those controlled processes get evaded, and cells will start to grow un uncontrollably and go very, very fast, take over where the normal cells were, and if that goes unchecked, then that cancer will start to spread over the whole body. So these instructions that control how cancer, how cells divide are really important. And the instructions for how the body works is held in our genomes, in the DNA that codes in our genomes. And if you want to know about big data and how to use big data, you don't need to look any further than our own cells, because our own genomes are the best known system for efficiently and effectively using big data. And our genomes are both beautifully simple and also almost unfeasibly complex. So they are simple because the DNA is made up of a very simple code of just four building blocks denoted by the letters A, C, T, and G. But it's complex partly just because of the sheer size of the genome. So if we were to watch this slide go through the whole genome, we would have to sit here for 10 years because there's 3 billion letters of code. I probably could go on that longer, long about the wonders of DNA, but fortunately for you, I only have 15 minutes. But uh, what we're trying to do when we're trying to find out what's caused cancer is to look to see if there are errors in that code, what we call mutations. And those can be very simple. It might just be that two letters, A and C, have been deleted from the code, and that's enough to set that cell um, in the cycle towards be becoming a cancer cell. So we've known for a long time, nearly 50 years, that the genome is important to cancer. And we've been able to find ways in which we can understand more about that and to make advances that have helped the treatment of cancer. But we've been hampered by the tools, the technological tools we have to actually read the code. So until very recently, we had to read that code one letter at a time, and that was very slow. But over the last few years, there's been a revolution in how we can read the DNA sequence. Now you can fragment the genome into millions of fragments and read all those millions all at once. So things that used to take us years before, we can now do in hours. And this hasn't been a, a, a sort of gradual iterative change. This has been a sort of wipe the slate clean, all bets are off, anything is possible kind of change. And what it's done is it's sort of moved us from, if you think about an experiment being like a journey from A to B, before we were sort of hobbling along in sticks, we were reasonably happy, we didn't know any better and we were making some progress. But suddenly, we can think about sort of flying through experiments by rockets. So the potential of what we're able to do has vastly changed. So there are many ways in which this genome information is going to be helpful for all sorts of branches of science and medicine. For cancer, I'll just tell you a couple of the ways. So this is what a prostate cancer looks like down a microscope. And diagnosis of cancer, the foundation of that has been looking down the microscope for decades, and it remains how we define and diagnose cancer. But now, with genome sequencing, what we can do is look to see what the genome of those cancers are, and that's what the genome of a prostate cancer would look like. And what that's showing us in the much more exquisite detail is all of those different types of mutations that have led to that cancer occurring. If we know the specific mutations that have caused that cancer, then we can develop much more tailored treatments. 
So most chemotherapy drugs work by targeting dividing cells. Because the cancer cells are dividing much faster and much greater than the normal cells, they get killed preferentially. But normal cells are dividing, so they do also get targeted. And that's why so many chemotherapy drugs have so many substantial side effects. But if we know the specific mutations in those cancer cells that have driven it to become a cancer cell now, we can make a specific targeted drug that just targets that mutation. So firstly, it will be more effective, but also, crucially, it won't affect the normal cells, and so it will have many fewer side effects. So the area in which I particularly work is in discovering genes that cause hereditary cancers. So most cancers are not hereditary. I don't want to alarm people. But sometimes you can have um, mutations that are passing down through the generations. When that happens, it's devastating for the families. Lots of members of the families will get particular patterns of cancer. So one of those cancers, probably the most famous one, is a, a, a gene, sorry, cancer genes, is a gene called BRCA1. How many people sort of saw the story of Angelina Jolie and the, and the BRCA1 story over the summer? Okay, pretty much everybody. So in Angelina Jolie's family, affecting her and her mother and potentially other people, there is a mutation in this BRCA1 gene that's giving a very high risk of cancer. How many people sort of made the assumption that the sort of testing and the care that her family was able to have was kind of in the preserves of the, the rich and the famous rather than being sort of available to the sort of ordinary people? So about half and half. Well, it is about, it sort of is and it isn't. We can do that kind of testing. That's particularly what I do. We've seen in our unit at the Mars and hundreds of family, exactly like Angelina Jolie's family, and we have been able to offer them a gene test. But that gene testing is very restricted because it uses these old technologies for sequencing the genome. And that means it's laborious, it's expensive, and it means basically that there have to be a very complicated system to sort of restrict so that only a few people can access this very costly um, technology. But of course, as I'm sure you've already realised, potentially one can adapt these new sequencing technologies to make this kind of gene testing much, much easier. We can get rid of this complicated system and allow many, many more people to access genomic testing. And what we should all be aspiring to is for all cancer patients to have access to genome testing. If we achieve that, will it be heralded as a breakthrough? Will it make the front pages? Will people win prizes? Probably not. Because I think sometimes we can be a bit seduced to thinking that uh, have quite a narrow view of what innovation is. It's all about the new, it's about the discoveries, it's about the visions for the future. But sometimes if we focus too much on the future, it can be at the, the expense of the present. And if that's at the expense of the health of uh, the current people, then we have a responsibility to think carefully about that and focus our energies in the right places. So... I'm currently um, leading a very talented group of people supported by the Wellcome Trust on a program that's trying to do that. It's called the Mainstreaming Cancer Genetics Program. And what we're trying to do is marshal these amazing new changes of genomic technology and use them so that many, many more people can have access to um, gene testing. So the critical problem that had stopped this happening before was that we just couldn't <coughs> sequence those genes, do those gene tests, fast enough or cheap enough. And that bottleneck is removed by the new technologies with a bit of tweaking. But of course, as is often the case, when you remove one bottleneck, all you're doing is simply moving it somewhere else. And so there are new bottlenecks that have emerged that we now have to tackle them. And those are questions like, what does this sequence mean? And that is a really, really big question. It's a pervasive challenge that is anybody who's dealing with genomic information, three billion letters of code is having to um, deal with. And we've heard about what does it mean quite a lot over the last couple of days. And it's absolutely crucial that we correctly interpret this DNA sequence information. And there are a lot of challenges to that. So we're looking for these, these mutations that might cause cancer. But one of the challenges is that our genomes are littered with mutations. We all have thousands and thousands of mutations. Most of them are innocuous. Some of them are dangerous. Some of them are dangerous, but only in certain circumstances. And even the most obvious things, the things that are sort of shouting at us, I am a cancer gene, can be a bit deceptive. Because I am a cancer gene is very like, I am a cancer gene. 
but obviously that would have to be uh, managed in a completely different way. I should clarify, there is no human gene mutation that makes humans canter. Um, but you get the point that really quite subtle changes, really small misinterpretations could have really profound effects. So rather than helping people, we could end up doing harm. So we and, and many other people are trying to tackle this issue, and I'm sure there are all sorts of ways in which uh, you might be able to help us with it. We've developed a system which is called SIGMA, Clinical Impact of Genetic Mutation Analysis. And essentially what SIGMA is, is, is simply a framework. It's a framework through which we can integrate and bring together all of the different types of information, all of the different expertise that we need in order to make the right um, decision and know what the correct clinical impact is. It's a developing system. Uh, I think it might end up being my life's work. Um, but, and it is an area where big data is going to be a big help. So people are going to be sequenced. We're going to get more and more sequence information. But as Jeremy and as other people have said, what we really need to do is be able to marshal this data, be able to access that data so people can use it um, and learn those um, lessons from it. Because the more data you put into a system like this, the better that the interpretations are that you get out at the other end of it. The other major, major challenge that we have is we need to remodel our health services so that instead of only dealing with a few hundred tests in a very specialised way, we need to have a way in which we can routinely um, use these genomic tests and this information. And that has a number of different types of challenges. Some of them are really quite prosaic, um, sort of logistical. Health services are not famous for being sort of nimble and uh, flexible. But actually, probably the biggest challenge here is a behavioural challenge, because intrinsically, uh, people are a little bit suspicious and not very keen to change. So education is an absolute key to this. We have to have both the doctors, the clinicians, and the patients and the public feeling confident, feeling confident that the changes that we want to have input are going to help, but also to feel confident that the old systems, the robustness and the care of the old systems, are also in place. So we have developed such a system, which I hope works, in terms of making genetic testing seamless, more flexible, faster, but also still having the support of making sure that people are making informed decisions. And we've been piloting that system in the Marsden over the, over the summer, and about uh, 100 patients have gone through that. And uh, in fact, so far, it's been a resounding success. It's gone better than I ever could have hoped for it. The patients like it. The doctors like it. It works. So what we're trying to do now is think of uh, trying to make a sort of toolkit of that process so that it can be rolled out um, across the um, NHS to help uh, many, many more um, patients. So I'm going to uh, sort of wrap up there. I hope that in this short time I've been able to make you all genome evangelists. Um, there certainly is the potential for the genome to have really tremendous impact. I've just talked about cancer, but you could make the same story for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, for all sorts of other scientific things. But we do have to be cautious evangelists, if that's not a contradiction in terms. Um, and we have to be absolutely clear and careful that we're interpreting this information correctly so that we're maximising the benefits, minimising the harms, and helping as many people as possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>